Is this thing on? I want to say, first of all, much love to Zoe Strauss and Eileen Baker. And they were ex extremely, extremely important to me growing up in my formative years, in my teenage years. And I remember uh, Eileen asked me if I would be a mentor to Cosmo Strauss, who is a well-regarded DJ in his own right. And I said, no, it's much better if he's it's intuitive and he learns it on his own. And that worked out OK. So, and I, I you know, got wiggled out of that mentorship role for a few more years. But eventually, it caught up to me. Let's see if this thing works. OK. This is at 61st in Market Street, 6124 Market Street. It is uh, a rooftop that I painted um, as a youth of, oh, 18 years old. Maybe not a youth anymore. I got into graffiti late. I got into it as a 16-year-old. The typical arc, arc is you start at like 12, and you, you end at 18. I started at 16 when all my uh, classmates at the advanced track at Archbishop Carroll um, we're getting ready for their SATs and whatnot. I got into graffiti. It satisfied my every need that I needed for color, design, adventure, line, design, color, adventure. It was all there for me. And the arts program that I was admired in at the time had none of that. So I went on these rooftops and I painted these rooftops and I had a great time doing it. And at the same time, you know, it was really unsatisfying to me that uh, you know, the work that I was doing was being completely vilified and made out to be this heinous crime that was leading to the decline of Philadelphia in so many ways. Uh, the Anti-Graffiti Network was found, founded on this premise and millions of dollars were poured into combating graffiti. 25 years later, there's still a ton of graffiti all over the place. There's still a ton of kids like, painting and writing graffiti on their own volition acquiring supplies through magical means and doing what they think they need to do to express themselves. And rather than getting help and support from organizations, they're just kind of pushed out in the cold. And what's happening now is there's a lot more jail time and there's a lot more penal you know, problems that are happening. Kids are getting thrown in jails. Um, a couple of kids in Texas got eight years in jail for uh, writing on walls, less walls than we did in West Philly. And it seems to be really out of balance and really out of whack. I mean, ultimately, what we're talking about is creativity. I mean, maybe it's, it's put in the wrong place at the wrong time, but ultimately, it's a visual crime. It's not, it's not pushing old ladies down steps. It's not mugging anybody. It's putting paint on a wall. Landlords have been putting paint on walls for thousands of years to increase the value of their property. So anyway, I came back to West Philadelphia, um, and, the, and you know, I've been living in New York since 1994, August 1st, and I've always been a Philadelphian in New York. I've never been anything but like this outside square peg in the round hole that is New York. And as an outsider, I felt like it was a really useful artist have always prided and always tried to find some place where they could be outside and, you know, me being a Philadelphian in New York was a great way to do that. I didn't even have to take off my overalls. It was awesome. <laughs> so to come home and to do a project in West Philadelphia, to take the resources and the, the love that was there for the art and then ask people to wrap their heads around graffiti and take graffiti into another context was a lot of fun. And, you know, this is art. This is the highest art you can do. This is involving community. This is taking input and data from the community, putting it on the wall. It is bringing people from all over the world back to a pl place in West Philly that many people haven't been going to for a long time. And it, it accomplished you know, all types of things beyond my wildest imagination in the, the year and change that it's been up. And you know, in the course of doing this, at the same time, we revisited graffiti. These are all locations that were pioneered by graffiti writers, locations that had beautiful artwork on them from 1967 to about 1990, when it became the eradication of graffiti became a monetary issue when people started to make money eradicating graffiti. Eradicating graffiti became a multi-billion dollar industry, you know, where people can just divert funds from real social services and pour it into just painting walls. Like, who cares? That wall is not what color, no matter what color that wall is going to be, it's still going to house, 
you know, problems. It's going to house broken families. It's going to house all types of things that, you know, just covering up the surface and making some kind of superficial, you know, cosmetic change isn't going to do anything for. So, yeah, I'm a little angry about that stuff, but I think it's a really interesting ability that we were able to go and, you know, we took the name out of it. We took the criminal aspects out of it. We kept the style. We kept the color. We kept the location. We kept the placement. And we created something that was really supremely powerful. And it was recognized by some very interesting people in Brazil, where I, I'm just coming home from two days ago. This is the work of twin brothers from the Centro District of Sao Paulo. Named, they call themselves Os Gemios, the twins. And what these guys have been doing is, for the last 20 years, traveling all around their city and painting things like this, this character, based on the people that live in these communities and, you know, in a very Brazilian, very kind of funny, you know, pretty way, but at the same time really has a social content. It really reflects the, the people that live in these areas. And, you know, there's an organization that's worked with these guys before that saw the Love Letter Project down there that said, hey, you know, we'd like to bring you down. We saw the Love Letter. Maybe you could write a Love Letter for Sao Paulo. Now, this is an arts organization that's basically funded with um, taxes on businesses. And as such, they, you know, they are tasked with regentrifying neighborhoods, of developing neighborhoods, and they have like nine satellite offices all throughout Sao Paulo. And it's an incredible organization. I mean, they have Gil Scott Heron, Ornette Coleman, all these people performing this week for this huge festival they're doing. And what we did down there was like, we were the visual arts component. But, you know, I'm a little bit wary of like regeneration schemes. And, you know, it was in a very Brazilian way where they called me like three weeks ago and they said, hey, we want to bring you down here and is it okay? <laughs> So I really felt, felt like I was dealing with ravers instead of like this really legitimate organization. <laughs> so I said, no, I'm not doing love letter down there. You know, we, we got standards. <laughs> but, but, you know, I love the twins and the twins have done so much to just elevate graffiti as like, you know, they haven't made it in art form, but they've taken it and they've said, look, it can be used to represent people in any area, it, you know, we seek to represent. And they've got a really wonderful knack of like, you know, bringing that out of people and doing really interesting things with it. What's interesting is they can get away with this any place they want in Sao Paulo because they're using color. Like this guy, they can paint this anywhere. Their whole neighborhood is just demolished with like artwork that they've created, you know, because of that color thing. They, you know, they're bringing color to these gray walls in these terrible, just, you know, hum just visions of just like the darkest humanity you've ever seen. And they're just bringing this little bit of life there and representing the people that live there. So we were charged with working in this neighborhood called Bam Hichiro, which means good place to retire. It, you know, for generations, it was a place that uh, coffee barons would have their mansions. And, you know, it was just a spectacular neighborhood that, like a lot of neighborhoods, you know, and it was the this, this center for immigration where successive waves of immigrants would come through. So as a person who's, my studio in New York is on Canal Street, you know, I'm really in tune with this. I love this. So, uh, you know, of course we can do that. We can work in any neighborhood you set us in. So there's also this a really amazing school, School of the Sacred Heart. My mother, dear mother, taught at the School of Sacred Heart, originally at Cedar Line in Haverford. It's now in Bryn Mawr somewhere. So I was like, oh, I can do this. This is no problem. You know, this is a beautiful school. This is from 1920. Had, you know, thousands of people have gone through this school. It's about to close because the neighborhood's gotten so dangerous. Um, subway line, and right underneath this bridge is a really prosperous area. So it's like in one of those really strange Brazilian ways, they have like what they call Crackalandia, and they have like this prosperity, people working, people are hustling, selling fruit, dragging trash, more trash, more trash, more trash. This guy is representing the Brazilian flag. This is the art center that they're building, and we were tasked with like painting this wall. So what do we do with this? You know, you have a wall, you, you don't speak Portuguese, we have to speak Portuguese, we have to put Portuguese art on the wall. And I had just, as a coincidence, I'd been there like three months ago, and I picked up on a phrase when I was just doing an art installation there, 
called Volto Ja, which means I'll be back. So we called this I'll be back, which you know suited the uh, art organization's needs very well because you know they want the neighborhood to come back. So what we did was we went around to the actual, I asked the, you know, people that were helping us, is there a community here? Oh no, nobody lives around here. Well of course everybody lives somewhere and there's hundreds of people that lived around here. And we took names, we took people's names. This woman's name is, uh, I believe, Alexandria, and she's in the PlayStation. And we, this is hard to see, but we took the amazing graphics off the packages of the snacks and the treats that are in um, Sao Paulo, which, you know, getting back to a graffiti context, in 1985, my good friend Sue Rock and his mentor, Mr. Blint, were, you know, proponents of this really simple graphic pop style that came right off of candy wrappers. So we went back to that route, and you know, Sal, Sal Paul is asking me to do me. This is what we do. So we took all the crummy, wonderful, and some really well-designed packaging to this point, and then we painted it. I took uh, Dercia's name. He was one of the guys, you know, with the carts of paper, and we painted it. And you know, this is graffiti. This is purely vandalism. This is the most disgusting. You know, should all be outraged right now. Call your senators. But at the same time, it's, you know, it's going into community, it's giving them, it's creating a portrait of a community, you know, using their names, using color, using design, spray paint, and, you know, vital, you know, taking this wall that wasn't doing anything for anybody anyway, and giving it power, and it becoming something totemic that the whole neighborhood could rally around. This is a good example of the working, you know, process get a crummy banana treat and uh, get a name and put them together. Ta-da! <laughs> you know, and after, it was one of those things where the first day we go there, we're asking names and people are like, why do you want my name? I'm not giving you my name. And then when they saw what we were doing, we just had an avalanche of requests. <laughs> I want to thank Nestle, the designers for the Brazilian division of Nestle had some really amazing designs. There's uh, the Icy Signs team realizing these designs. You know, that's two different guys. It's Benny and Benno. They were cops across the street. That's, the Volto Jaw is from uh, this really amazing Pasaquito, which is this, it's kind of like Reese's peanut butter without the uh, chocolate. It's really, really good stuff. More examples of uh, fine Brazilian design They're in, in action. Uh, this is uh, Habib. He makes a really tasty pizza treat. It's, I think they're like 40 cents each. They're this big. You get a box of like 40 at a time. We made him a police officer. <laughs> and these are the cops that like work right across the street from this area. And they're the cops that like patrol all of Cracklandia. And they're the cops that really don't do anything. No offense. <laughs> but when this building opens, the gate uh, opens and swings over in front of Habib. So he'll be in jail Monday morning. <laughs> uh, this gentleman is named Ismail. That's a parking. Anybody who's familiar with my history knows I have a great affinity for the guys wearing these crummy vinyl uh, coverings. I, may, I would give him a raincoat, but it's really hot down there. So what we did instead was we painted his face. Ta-da. And those, we had some really amazing six-year-old named Mary who was very savvy and very much understood what we were up to, who said, you shouldn't put that logo there that advertises beer and we are children. So yeah, just we got Ismail's name in place, and it you know again it, it's graffiti, but it's empowering. It delivers a, a message to a community. It's, it serves a lot of masters, and it does a lot of really interesting things. Um, this woman, uh, you know, we saw marching up and down the street on several occasions. She's kind of got a Brazilian Grace Jones thing happening, <laughs> and sorta uh, means lucky in in Portuguese. And we were just amazed that she had really clean socks every time we saw her. <laughs> so we got right to work. And we got right to work. And yeah. Uh, Dr. Thelma has an amazing uh, dentist practice right up the street, right across from where we were working. I love this happy tooth. It's happy it's being twisted out, you know? <laughs> so. I love my work. Uh, it's just a grateful coincidence that, that these pieces match these guys' outfits. 
these guys clean up the neighborhood and you know come Friday they're just like screaming with joy you got to hear it it's amazing Otavio and Gustavo also references the two brothers that's the names of the uh, Gemios this is a uh, um, the national drink Juana and it's also Janino's which means Junior's name and instead of a uh, uh, Antarctica, which is under the uh, Guarana name, it's uh, Bom Hichiro, and he is an original of Brazil, so we're proud to have him there. And so it went on, on and on and on. And there's actually, we did two of these walls, and there's actually a, a third wall that we wanted to paint, but they didn't, they didn't think anybody would see it, so they didn't want us to paint it. And then they really regretted the decision when we, they saw how fast we were working. Um, the guy on the right, he's kind of hard to see, but he's from the Pasaquito, the peanut treat. And we tied him back into the Philly project by giving him a Philly's cap and the Muslim beard. <laughs> so, you know, it's really great. Like, we, you know, Philly and Brazil probably have this whole long history of, you know, style that's been passed and forth between them, you know, and getting to a real fundamental level. There was like a real tag style that happened that the Brazilians do and they swear it's theirs and Philadelphians do and we swear it's ours. It's like this really tall elongated style that you know when it's done correctly it's meant to mimic the height and the presence of the person that's doing it. So as I pointed out earlier the, the twins have a really good knack of like going places and painting things and being able to do the things that they want to do because they use color. So when I showed up and I said look I just want to do this they were like oh man you know you're, you're gonna get us arrested. But you know it ties into the work that I do and the paintings that I make to do these really like my man Johnny Goldstein's doing, these things that just, you know, it's cramming as much information as possible, it's trying to say everything I can about, you know, the people that I'm representing at the same time. Um, there was a one graffiti in the middle of it that was actually done in lipstick, somebody was saying, I love you, and Paula loves Andriano, so we, we saved that, and we added to it. And, you know, typically my work in the studio is like of a whole very simple nature of just like, nothing to do is everything with you. It's, uh, paintings about, you know, never ever say never. And then I, I have these paintings that get really complicated again with multiple imagery, which I didn't spray paint. It was fun to take it out of the studio and put it to work in the street. And it, it's just a whole bunch of in-jokes to myself. The top left corner, it's meant to say shoegazing, because I love shoegazer music, if you know what that's about. I have no filter. Ask me about my style, you know, when graffiti writers do things, they say they're burners. So, you know, ask me about my style, it's a burner. The first tag I ever did looked like that. Uh, that's my name. Uh, I am made to leave, I am made to return. This is every human being. They leave their house, they come back at night. Also the train. And this is a whole portrait. Busy B is, you know, a great emblemic figure in, a, in New York mythology who made his name out of money, spelled it in the form of a B. No. And, um, <laughs> and so it goes. And, you know, this is the portrait of New York. That's uh, David Byrne. I saw him last night riding his bicycle, and I won't let him forget it. And that's what I do, and thank you very much. Thank you.